welcome everybody to this um, Now we're on. <laughs> Again, hello and welcome everybody to this hybrid press conference here from Vienna. Um, this is a press briefing about the negotiations of the UN Cybercrime Convention. My name is Thomas Lohninger, I'm executive director of the European Digital Rights Organization Epicenter Works, and I'm here in Vienna with Electronic Frontier Foundation, Article 19, Access Now, Epicenter Works, and Global Partners Digital. Um, we are here for the fifth session on the negotiations of this new treaty on cybercrime, which really has the potential to drastically redraft criminal law all around the world. It represents a tectonic shift because of its global nature when it comes to the cross-border access to our personal information. And uh, we are talking about a global convention, which will also set a worldwide standard, um, both on surveillance measures as well as uh, criminal law when it comes to computer-related crime. This is what we want to discuss with you here today. And uh, we'll shortly start with a quick round of introduction uh, with one of our five experts that I'm shortly going to introduce. We have um, Katica, Policy Director for Global Privacy Electronic Frontier Foundation. We have Babora, a Senior Director for Law and Policy at Article 19. We have Raman, a Global Cybersecurity League and Senior International Counsel at Access Now. Tanya Fakhatala, Policy Advisor from Epicenter Works, and last but not least, Ali, Global Engagement and Advocacy Lead at Global Partners Digital. Um, last words, this is a hybrid press conference, so uh, journalists are able to ask questions here, and please do so both from the room as well from the Zoom. So uh, you can use the chat for this, but also raise your hand and then we'll put you on the speakers here and also uh, see your webcam picture should you wish so. Um, and you can already start questions, uh, start raise questions in the chat or raise your hands. So, without further ado, Katica, please start. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Today, I would like to discuss the current direction of the ongoing negotiations of the UN Cybercrime Treaty, specifically in the chapter of surveillance and international cooperation. But before analyzing the text, let's just start discussing briefly the historical context of the ongoing negotiations. And to start, let's discuss the Budapest Convention is the main existing treaty on international cooperation on cybercrime. It was negotiated in 2001 by member states at the Council of Europe and has been recently extended last year. EFA has drastically criticized the Cybercrime Convention for its vague human rights safeguards and for the secret leave negotiation process. Still, Budapest has become the de facto standard for cross-border cybercrime policing. Russia, however, objected the Budapest Convention for totally different reasons, citing concerns that it infringed on human rights, no, that it infringes on state sovereignty, sorry, by allowing other nations to investigate cybercrime in its jurisdictions. That's one of the main reasons why Russia proposed this treaty in 2017. And it was only in 2019 that the UN General, UN General Assembly adopted a resolution to start the negotiation on this UN process. This proposal was addressed by Russia, Cambodia, Belarus, China, Iran, Myanmar, Nicaragua, Syria, and Venezuela. Many countries opposed it, including the United States and the European Union, with concerns on their human rights uh, protections and human rights on human rights. We also oppose it for similar reasons. Fast forward to 2002, the UN opened negotiations of this cybercrime treaty, with member states start in, engaging in negotiation and proposing amendments. Rus Russia was widely denounced by many negotiating parties at this stage for the illegal invasion of Ukraine, a criticism that many states, many states are still doing during these week's negotiations. Many states even highlighted its lack of credibility in respect to sovereignty, but nevertheless, Russia got the ball rolling on this negotiation, and many of its proposals made it into the first consolidated negotiation text. But geopolitics is always messy, and by April 2022, many democratic countries that had strongly opposed the draft treaty were actively engaging in the negotiations and pursuing compromises through amendments. 
While forming alliance is essential in global negotiations, it could, in this case, involve compromising the level of human rights protections, such as strong safeguards, um, limiting surveillance, unless a diverse coalition of countries emerge to champion human rights. The consequence of such compromises could lead to a race of the bottom for human rights and privacy protections. Although the treaty has adopted an inclusive drafting approach in contrast to the Budapest negotiation of the Budapest Convention, incorporated significant input from civil society, some of its proposals continue to raise serious concerns as they potentially adopt some of the world's problematic practices in digital policing. Now let's discuss the scope of the surveillance, the digital surveillance power and international cooperation chapter. Uh, various states have proposed extending these surveillance powers to any criminal offense, rather than limited to investigations of a specific crimes uh, uh, specifying the convention, which we believe are core sovereign crimes, or at least to serious crimes with a penalty, a minimal penalty of four, punishment of four years. And this is very troubling because intrusive surveillance technologies on powers are increasing use for petty crimes or for crimes that are even uh, inherently illegal under international law or they use it with very insufficient or lack of, real, uh, of effective human rights safeguards. So one other e big issue that we are facing in the negotiations is that there is no an effective global system in place to make sure human rights are enforced. So not many governments want to limit their own power to spy and track people, people closely because of this, the convention it may end up legitimizing intrusive surveillance powers that invade people's rights and infringe upon uh, people's human rights. The Draft Convention has uh, this problem of this vague uh, scope, and this vague scope it also has repercussions in the chapter of international cooperation. The cross-border policing chapter does not limit itself to international cooperation in a specific criminal uh, investigations or prosecutions. And this opened the door for one state to share information with others using a method that may be not permissible under international human rights law, let's say mass surveillance, but sharing the information with others. Another issue is the problem of dual criminality requirement in the convention. Uh, on international cooperation and assistance, which many states are actually right now still calling for it in the treaty. If the, this provision is not included, what it means is that states could find themselves assisting in investigations of activities they don't consider actually criminal in their own country, or are even, even pity ones, including through the use of these very intrusive surveillance powers. Unfortunately, instead of progressing towards a human rights-based approach in the negotiation of the treaty, as of now, the current draft test is moving away from them. Countries such as India, Russia, China, Iran, Syria, Egypt, and Tonga have even proposed to delete reference to international human rights obligations. Some others have asked to delete reference to data protections or even to the pr principle of legality, proportionality, and necessity. Removing these core principles and the obligations to provide adequate protections when you are giving these very strong surveillance powers to states could not only undermine privacy at the global level, but it could also undermine existing international human rights standards that have been developed at the United Nations and through court cases. Time is its essence right now, and we need to get this right. Retaining these core safeguards is an essential first step to adopting a human rights perspective treaty. So I'm going to give quickly three examples of why this text is problematic. And one is the interception of content and real-time collection, which we all know is one of the most invasive surveillance powers. The current draft won't enable this, this type of powers, but without a strong detail legal safeguards. Countries like Russia, Iran, Egypt want such intrusive powers, but are not prepared to agree with robust human rights standards. 
This could lead to a significant expansion of surveillance powers without adequate transparency, authorization, judicial authorization, oversight, or accountability mechanisms. This broad language will in 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 may inadvertently legitimize existing uh, problematic surveillance practice into un international instruments. Uh, the other provision that is very problematic is called in special investigative techniques. And this drug provision includes a blanket, a blanket term that could encompass a, whatever surveillance technology that exists now or could exist in the future, leaving to a state to decide what it means. Some, uh, and this could be very intrusive uh, surveillance, from mass surveillance, for fair recognition, to predicting policing. So these techniques um, can, this clause could legitimize any power or any surveillance that could exist now, exist in the future. This provision also has a very problematic clause which allowed the removal or replacement of data being transmitted over networks. What this means is that it, it recognized a broad power to block sites or block the internet uh, and so, or, so replacing also, and the word replacing also suggests using this power to engage in deception or disinformation, replacing the original message with a new one created by the country. So it's a little controversial, and we hope this whole article gets removed. So in conclusion, the coming zero draft expected in the new few weeks, because it's going to come the first zero draft of the treaty, could significantly shape the treaty scopes, either by make it overly broad or make it narrowing. We have to see what's going to happen next. But the draft treaty as it stands as of now, it could either embed human rights or it could actually uh, lower standards of privacy protections and human rights glo globally. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katica, for kicking us off. Next, Babora. Hello everyone, oh, this I need to put this on. So hello everyone, I am here on behalf of Article 19, which is an international free speech organization and we work with journalists, human rights defenders and whistleblowers around the world and we also look in countries around the world how already existing cybercrime legislation is used against these this, this people. And similar to what Katica said, from the start we have been actually opposing this process itself and we have been gravely concerned about this kind of attempt based on the issues which Katica already outlined uh, that the, this treaty would start. And we have asked for this project to be abandoned, but obviously that hasn't happened, and our concerns are even more increased with the direction this treaty is having. So what I'm gonna say, uh, say here today is to focus on actually the crimes which this convention is proposing which is in the current draft, but also some countries, Iran, China, Pakistan, Russia, proposed additional crimes uh, to be included, and it's still to be seen, like what crimes will be there, but uh, there are great concerns. And um, so what is the problem with this, these crimes as, as we see them? First, our problem is that a lot of the proposed offenses are so-called speech offenses. So those are offenses when you are punished for spe speaking or doing something online. And because this peripherally involves using computer or digital technology. And there are extremely vague and overbroad provisions which the states would have to then replicate in their national legislation. So issues such as hate speech, fake news or false news, incitement or justification of terrorism, even engagement or coercion to suicide, and all of those very, very big terminology, which is, um, which is a subject of subjective interpretation and possibility for abuse. So for example, there was a proposal to include criminal defamation through cyber technology. And that would punish defamation on internet. But criminal defamation is already prohibited uh, or in violation of international freedom of exp expression standard, so should not have a space in this kind of uh, in, in this kind of document, or you know false news or even terrorism and all of these um, uh, examples which I just mentioned. And some of these issues have been already addressed 
in international freedom of expression standards. So this treaty is sort of trying to reinvent the bill or input these offenses to international treaty. So that's the first concern. And, and this is not just hypothetical concern, because in the countries where we work, we already see how similar provisions are misused against journalists or whistleblowers or, or human rights uh, activists or civil society in general. And if there is interest, I can speak more about that. Then the second problem is that the scope and the scale of the proposed crime is ex excessive. Compared to the Budapest Convention, which Katica mentioned, there are only nine offenses, and only two of them are speech-related. And this is copyright and child exploitation images. So we question why there needs to be this universal adoption of this wide range of offenses that have never been even mandated in regional, at the regional level, and in many instances would fail to meet international human rights standards. And then the third issue is that many of these offenses are cyber-enabled rather than cyber-dependent. And this, is a, this sounds like technical, but it is a problem because cyber-dependent crimes require digital infrastructure to commit them, right? So for example, illicit use of electronic payment instruments. But cyber-enabled offenses are those which can be aided by technology. But here is the problem because if the crime can be, com uh, can be committed by using a computer, it doesn't mean that this sh should be addressed in the international treaty. So overall, we are really concerned that many provisions of this proposed treaty, as far as the crimes are concerned, violates international freedom of expression standards. It will restrict freedom of expression. It should be concerned to journalists, human rights defenders, and you know, activists in general, because you might be prosecuted under these provisions if adopted in national legislation. And that as these negotiations continue, the states really must not lose the sight of the fact that content offenses, if coupled by this, um, this, this um, surveillance powers and other restrictions which Katica mentioned, this will create international carte blanche for those who want to use this tool to restrict freedom of expression globally. And this will be seen in the context of the surveillance powers that will be provided in the convention. So this treaty mustn't become the tool to use against journalists, activists, and human rights defenders, and those who are following us should really make sure and join the fight against it. Thank you very much, Barbara. Continuing with Roman. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I just wanted to briefly mention what Access Now does. We are an international civil society organization that seeks to protect and extend digital rights of individuals at risk. And what we do is a mix, in fact, of services. We provide digital security assistance to journalists, human rights defenders, and civil society globally. Uh, and we advocate, we monitor and analyze developments on digital rights that impact the digital rights of users with a particular focus sometimes on how cybersecurity impacts protected human rights, what Barbara and Katitsa spoke about a bit. This comes from an understanding that technology can empower but can also place people at risk. And therefore, this is why we've been following the cybercrime treaty process very carefully. Our view is simple. Any UN cybercrime treaty should make us more cybersecure. It should not make us less cybersecure. And the key part of any such international legal framework is that it should look at the human beings involved in cybersecurity, namely security researchers, digital security trainers, as well as journalists who investigate vulnerabilities and gaps in ICT systems. Unfortunately, our view is that the present text of the UN Cybercrime cyber Treaty process, unless drastically improved, would in fact make us more cyber insecure. And an important part of this is to recognize what happens every day. Preventing the exploitation of cybersecurity vulnerabilities or avenues of attack by malicious actors, criminals, and others requires not just criminalization, it's not just a law enforcement activity. It's a larger whole of society, whole of industry, whole of civil society effort that requires regularly identifying and fixing the vulnerabilities in our everyday ICT systems, the computers, mobile devices, and more that we are using for this conversation right now itself. 
It just requires human beings. These human beings are the ones who probe networks, research ICT systems, detect weaknesses, and, and find, uncover avenues of attack. And they help fix, reveal, and further address these gaps and exploits in systems. This is essentially a daily race that's happening for making sure that we have more effective cybersecurity, we have secure devices. A critical part of this is to ensure that there's a clear legal environment for this work, for cybersecurity research, for digital security training, and more. And that's what we believe needs to happen in the cybercrime treaty process. It's not just about creating a framework to penalize cyber criminals. It's to ensure that states create a legal framework that actively encourages more cybersecurity services and more proactive provision of cybersecurity education and training from all. In fact, we believe, therefore, there needs to be a positive obligation cast on UN member states through this process to make it better. Unfortunately, we don't believe that's happening. And that the current approach towards criminalization, which Barbara referred to a little bit, actually is chilling the work of journalists, chilling the work of activists, and those who work on security research more generally. And I want to emphasize this. It is very clear. Excessively broad cybercrime provisions impact cybersecurity research. They impact the provision of digital security services from civil society and others as well, and it results in more cyber instability. In fact, this is something that even this process on the cybercrime treaty has recognized. Fairly early on, even in during the first and second sessions of this ad hoc committee deliberating a proposed cybercrime instrument, delegates recognize that national security and cybersecurity issues are complicated, but you need to make sure that the work of security research is encouraged. There was discussion on fact, and even part of the process, questions asked about how do we better protect penetration testers and more. And unfortunately, we believe that while the questions were asked, the actual treaty text they've come up with doesn't do enough there. And the reasons for that are simple. In effect, by creating provisions that criminalize the intrusion into networks in, and what you call as core cyber crimes, again, Barbara referred to them a little bit, what you would refer, refer to as the cyber dependent crimes, all those activities are also activities that security researchers and activists do all the time. In order to detect, for example, whether my laptop is being hacked, a security researcher may probe a network, may try to uncover or find out what vulnerability is. It's equivalent, for example, of sometimes a carpenter or a mechanic banging around to find a problem. And that is a core thing that they do. This doesn't often work on the basis of authorization. Often the people who discover the weaknesses and the exploits that you might see in the front page of newspapers are security researchers who, without permission perhaps, or just out of their interest, hopefully following a clear ethical framework, have discovered those vulnerabilities. We had hoped that the cybercrime treaty process would see clear language that protects these researchers by making it obligatory on states to put very heightened requirements for intent to say that it's not just intrusion into a network, but that it is specific intrusion with malicious intent or with intent to do harm that should be there. And instead, we have seen states push back. We have seen some states say that, no, we want to have as broad a criminal provision as we can. And we believe that that's actually dangerous, because while some states do have safeguards, for example, in the European Union, the Dutch government in the Netherlands has guidance on when security researchers should be prosecuted or not. And even the US federal government recently came out with guidance on the fact that they will not criminalize good faith security research. We believe that that's actually something that shouldn't be left to the discretion of states. It should be encouraged actively in the treaty process. And we don't actually see that, in, see that there. I think it's also important to note that these are not academic uh, questions. Some of you may be familiar with the case of Ola Bini, the Ecuadorian security researcher, who was subject to a long, painful criminal trial, in fact, because he just tried to connect to a government system to see if there was a potential vulnerability there. And while in Ola Bini's case, he was released after, or not released, I would say, but he was acquitted, that required a long, painful trial that's still not complete. And that's because that law is vague. And imagine now that you have an international instrument, a treaty, that forces the criminalization of all these activities, but doesn't put in safeguards. In effect, what you're saying is you want to force criminalization, but you don't want to learn from the mistakes that all these nation states have encountered over the last 10 to 20 years of these hacking provisions. So in fact, that's what we're worried about, that failing to provide legal protection for security researchers, whether in the form of heightened intent requirements for these core cyber-dependent uh, crimes, uh, or a standalone, perhaps, exception for legitimate security research, would be a mistake that not just the global information security community, but all of civil society could ill afford. Part of that reason also is because this work is not just that of technical experts or geeks, it's journalists, for example, who discover weaknesses in security systems and ICT, 
And they uncover this. And in fact, instead of making it better for them, some of the proposals in this treaty actually say there should be enhanced penalties if journalists are involved in issues relating to leaked information from government systems. This just shows to you how this could be misused and weaponized, perhaps not intentionally by all the member states part of this process, but by many of them, perhaps. And therefore, what we're hoping is that there is an opportunity for this to be fixed. We should see heightened requirements for these core cyber crimes, or there should be safeguard measures put into the treaty text itself that protect security researchers, digital security trainers, journalists, and more. Because the reality is that the second cybersecurity research discovers vulnerabilities in the systems of the powerful, in the systems of, the, of those who are connected, or digital security trainers protect folks from perhaps overbroad surveillance or intrusion, they may be subject to criminalization. And why shouldn't a UN treaty drag standards up rather than drag all global standards further low? Thank you so much, Roman, for this reality check. It's always good to remind everybody the Cybercrime Treaty is supposed to make us more secure, not less. Um, continuing on uh, to my colleague Tanya and a European perspective on the negotiations. Well, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm with Epicenter Works, and um, just to give you a brief introduction of the organization, it's an NGO that is based in Vienna, and we focus on digital uh, on human rights in the digital sphere. So among the focuses that we have is, for example, the prohibition of indiscriminate data retention or government hacking in Austria, but also at EU level, and nationally we've been quite successful with the latter. Um, Coming to the Cybercrime Convention, what are we actually talking about? Um, we've heard from my colleagues before that um, there is something like the Budapest Convention, right? It is a European treaty. It, was, um, it, came, it came about um, in, in the framework of the Council of Europe. And um, one could generally, very globally say that it is a treaty that was negotiated among like-minded European countries, Western countries with a common human rights tradition and understanding. Broadly speaking, I know, but this is to keep it, to keep it uh, more general to see um, where the UN Convention might lead us. So this treaty has served as a blueprint for many other countries that either acceded to that treaty, um, countries from outside the European continent, or who, uh, countries that um, drafted their national legislations along the lines of um, that, that treaty. So where would the UN Convention lead us? We've heard that there have been certain interests of some states to bring about a global, globally applicable UN Convention. And whereas it is very exciting to be part of a no negotiation of a UN treaty, and that is because it only happens every other decade, so this is a rare and special occasion to witness, no doubt about that, but we have to keep in mind that the UN Convention, a UN Convention, if it, if it were to be adopted, would take it all much further. It would, apply, it would apply globally with all the differences in human rights and rule of law standards and traditions that one can think of. So like literally global application. In short, and that is very important, it aims to set global standards to fight cybercrime, but it could also, if it were to fail, set a global standard of how we all lose our privacy. And there is a real danger that this could happen. So the draft treaty does not only have a potentially broad scope, it massively expands the possibilities um, of law enforcement authorities' access to data through worldwide interoperability. Such surveillance measures that we've already tackled upon include real -time, the real-time collection of traffic data, um, the interception of content data, search and seizure of stored computer data, the expedited preservation of stored computer data, um, or an expedited preservation and partial disclosure of traffic data. And on top of that, there are suggestions to um, admit, to have an obligation to admit electronic evidence in, court, in a court of law that stems from these um, surveillance or, well, investigation powers. And obviously, um, we are currently discussing a huge chapter on mutual legal assistance. So you can see this is a very broad, very intrusive, potentially very intrusive um, treaty. Um, it is also pretty clear, I guess, from what, we've, what you've heard so far, that we urgently need strong safeguards, and these, unfortunately, so far are not in place. And I will just name two of them, which, um, given the background of, of my organization, are very key to us, one of which is the exclusion of government hacking. So 
the way at the moment that many, the way many provisions at the moment are drafted is very broad, and it does not, for example, rule out the use of government hacking. Um, so working for the, an organization in Europe that managed three times to avoid that from happening in Austria, we advocate for an explicit requirement to be added that any investigative powers must be conducted in ways not to compromise the security of digital communications and services. It must be ensured that government hacking must not be justified in any, in any ways. And it is key to us because it is, government hacking is unlike any other form of existing surveillance techniques. It is far more intrusive. Um, it permits remote um, uh, and secret access to personal devices and data stored on them. Um, it can be, it can conduct various forms of uh, real-time surveillance. Um, it can manipulate data on devices without leaving any trace. So it really is something one has to be very worried about if that were to be included or potentially included in, in, in the convention. Um, not, not to forget, it also affects privacy and security of others in unpredictable ways. So it is not only one, uh, one subject that might be uh, concerned, but then also everybody else potentially that this person, this person communicates with. And it exploits the vulnerabilities in systems to facilitate um, surveillance objectives. And we just heard what that could mean for digital security aims. So it really is at odds with it. Um, the second remedy that we currently are not seeing in the, in the draft treaty is an effective remedy. And it is key to us um, that the right to an effective remedy for the violation of privacy be included um, it is not only, such, such a remedy would not only have to be known so that people actually um, are aware that this exists and um, has to be accessible, but then it is also key that if that were included the way it, it, it should be in order to be meaningful, um, it should include a prompt, thorough and impartial investigation um, of, all of, of all violations. Um, also, there needs to be a power to order the end of all ongoing violations and the full and unhindered access to the relevant uh, information and the capacity to issue binding orders if that were to be included in a meaningful way. As I said right now, we don't see anything um, of this in the draft treaty. We hope this is, um, there is still, still some time, but we hope this is going to change because it really is key. The bottom line of what I've just said well, we are not against mod modern um, law enforcement um, techniques because we understand modern law enforcement in response to new developments in this field of cybercrime is, of course, important and necessary, but the present draft goes far beyond the simple goal. Um, in this session and also in the following ones, it is key to move forward um, and to, to move towards a narrow scope, strong safeguards, and no excessive investigation powers to protect us all. Otherwise, we end up with the lowest common denominator that puts the privacy of millions of people at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya, to remind us what a rare occasion this negotiation is. So we better pay attention, and a lot is at stake. And before we open up for question, last but not least, Ali. <clears throat> Thank you, Thomas. Um, just to briefly introduce Global Partners Digital, who I'm here on behalf of. Uh, we are a human rights organisation working to ensure a digital environment underpinned by human rights. And we come to work on this issue of cybercrime laws because we see from experience that such laws can both undermine as well as enable human rights. Um, and like my colleagues, we've been observing this process to elaborate a treaty from the outset. Um, like other civil society groups and like some countries, we were then and we remain skeptical about whether such a treaty is necessary, uh, but we've continued to engage in the process because of the risks that we see to human rights and the need to mitigate those. Um, so my colleagues before me have outlined um, the key risks that this treaty poses um, and the high stakes of this process. And these include the vast scope of crimes, including speech offences, the lack of safeguards which could permit intrusive surveillance, and the fact that indeed it could undermine rather than enable cybersecurity. Um, so just to add to those points, I'd like to bring us back to the negotiations which we've come directly from today, and to um, share some of what's currently being discussed by states in relation to the topic of international cooperation.
And then after that, I'll say just a very brief note on what's next in the process, but maybe we can come back to that in the questions. Um, so just to give some background, uh, international cooperation is one of the topics that's being discussed today by countries. It includes various things, including extradition, for example, and sharing of electronic evidence through the mechanism of mutual legal assistance. Uh, to give some context, the reason that many countries say that they're engaging in this process is precisely because they want to strengthen international cooperation on cybercrime. But at the same time, um, and many of them indeed have said today that they see it as the heart of the treaty, um, but at the same time as they're saying this, we're hearing certain countries reject the inclusion of practical and robust safeguards which are derived from their existing human rights law obligations. Um, you've already heard some examples of what those safeguards are from my colleagues. Um, in the context of international cooperation, they include the requirement of dual criminality, uh, limiting cooperation to the offences in the convention, and limiting it to serious crimes as well as the ability for countries to refuse to cooperate on the basis of human rights concerns. Um, so we're hearing some countries argue that um, it's not necessary to include these practical safeguards uh, because we already have, earlier in the treaty, an article on human rights and another article on conditions and safeguards. Um, but to these points, I'd just like to share a couple of reflections. Uh, so the first, on the point that they're making, that these practical examples aren't necessary, while it's important to note that the text is still very much live and still under negotiation, um, and the current wording that we're seeing on human rights, indeed, isn't adequate to ensure protection, as you've already heard. Uh, so we really cannot rely on that argument that these protections are already guaranteed elsewhere in the treaty. Um, and then second... Uh, on the notion that um, the treaty will strengthen international cooperation. Um, well, indeed, uh, we see that the safeguards, rather than being an obstacle to such cooperation, should really be seen as enabling. Um, that not having them would introduce uncertainty, uncertainty, and that would hinder cooperation, the very thing that certain states are saying that they desire by virtue of the treaty. And it would also cause risk to human rights, most importantly, that's why we're here. Um, so um, we're pleased to hear a few of the countries reinforcing that this morning. Um, then I'd like to just say a note briefly on what's next in the process, but we can perhaps come back to this too. Uh, we're currently in the fifth session of the negotiations on the treaty. And in this session and in the previous session, we've been hearing the views of countries on what's called a consolidated negotiating document. Um, the views shared in this session and in the previous one will form the basis of a zero draft, which will be shared ahead of the sixth session, which will be, uh, take place in August of this year. The zero draft is an advanced stage of the treaty um, and the negotiations over its contents will be even more politicised, and yes, that is possible. Um, so we do really have some concerns that the treaty is being developed at such a time when there's still so many questions about the scope, um, about what will be criminalised, about the lack of conditions and safeguards. Um, and we also note that the process to elaborate this treaty is really ambitious. So after the sixth session in August, uh, there's due to be a final session in early 2024 uh, where countries will um, potentially agree on the contents of the treaty. Um, and that, you know, gives us grave concern because, uh, that, as you've heard, the implications of what's being discussed are very serious and it's a very short time frame in which to do it. Um, so I'll finish there. Thank you so much, Ellie. So now we come to the interactive part of this press briefing. So in case you have questions, you want clarifications, you have thoughts on all of this, um, please raise your hand, both here in the room as well as virtually. And you can also use the chat uh, in order to ask your questions. And because uh, while we are waiting for this, um, Barbara, I would like to start with you uh, from a global perspective 
freedom of speech organization perspective, you mentioned that compared to Budapest, um, the scope has been much broadened. What would be the impact of that, particularly from a global perspective? Like, could you identify this harm for freedom of speech to us? Yes, so as I said before, um, some of these proposed provisions, are, especially from like problematic countries, as you know, Katica mentioned some of them, you know, Iran, Pakistan, China, Russia, are already in the existing domestic cybercrime laws, and they have been used to prosecute, as I said, journalists, whistleblowers, human rights activists, or like people who are using internet in the countries where they were adopted, and if they are replicated in the convention, this will embolden these undemocratic states to, uh, to, to proceed further. But these are not hypothetical cases. Um, the case of Olabini was already mentioned, but under existing cybercrime laws, those are even things like in Tunisia, recently the government adopted new cybercrime act and they have been prosecuting an activist and a professor who criticized government online. Or there is a student activist who has a Facebook page which uh, monitors what is happening in the neighborhood and there have been some clashes uh, with the police and protesters and the person have been prosecuted under the cybercrime law for uh, causing disorder through internet. Or in Sudan, there is a Facebook page which was run by human rights activists and during pandemic they criticized that in Sudan there was not enough EPP equipment and they have been also prosecuted under the local cybercrime law. Or um, in uh, Thailand, somebody liked a Facebook post which was critical of a monarch and the prime minister and this person was prosecuted under cybercrime law. And all of these people are facing long sentences so, so again, if this is instituted or similar provisions are replicated in the international treaty, this will make situation on the ground for those who are critical of the government much worse. Thank you. Um, Katica, I think you've been working more than anybody on international treaties like that. Um, what, what is your point of comparison, also from, from the historical arc, if you compare it with previous treaties that you negotiated where you have observed how is the level of access and what is most missing? Like, is there uh, one particular thing that negotiators could do in order to fix it, in order to bring it more in line with human rights? Yeah, this is two questions but in one, thank you. Uh, when it comes to civil society participation, yeah, I have been working through the trade agreements, TPP, and many other international agreements, uh, not only on cybercrime, but on many other areas uh, on, on digital rights issues through my career. But as I see, it's very hard for civil society to be able to have a seat at the table, and especially be able to read the amendments. I think this this, despite the content of the treaty, I will say that the, the, the opportunity to participate and read amendments and understand sometimes the very honest comments of these countries with poor human rights records on the, on the records have been surprising to me. Being said that doesn't mean that actually the mechanism for effective legal society participation is fully in place, you know? I think it's also an experiment because it's the first time but uh, we don't know why we see our documents, you know, in, in, in the, the in, in the YS screen and our amendments. We know we don't. There are a lot of informal meetings and a lot of negotiations behind when we cannot know what's happening there. And also, um, um, doesn't mean that because we have a seat at the table, we actually going to see good proposals. And as we have seen the direction of the organization, the, the text is concerning when it comes to human rights. Now, regarding the question of um, um, how to ensure uh, effective human rights protections, there are two things. In addition, uh, I would like to see a collection of NGO, uh, a collection of states championship a stronger human rights protections. I'm not only talking about data protection. I, I'm talking also on the on the right to privacy. More detailed safeguards when it comes to um, put limits to government access to data, especially when it comes to very serious 
uh, investigative powers. But uh, the problem that we see, and that's the problem when countries copy-paste from different treaties, copying from Budapest to the United Nations, is not replicable. First, uh, there is a lot of documentation and court cases, I even background information on guidance notes on the Cybercrime Convention. Uh, when it comes to Article 15 of the safeguards. Well, we have criticized it because this is still, when we do a national uh, legal, uh, comparative analysis of surveillance laws across jurisdictions, we have seen that this Article 15 of the PES has not been translatable on effective safeguards. Being said that, the background documents and some of the explanatory memorandum of the treaty have provided a lot of information to states on how to do that. But translating this into another context mm -hmm. and with even more wider human rights records, just to make a note, Budapest is also very diverse. We have countries like Turkey, like Philippines. There is not only European countries. But here is even wider and the diversity of the human rights protections and levels is even wider. So I don't think that even having safeguards in place will solve the problem. Because the problem that some of these countries have is at the core of the lack of democratic safeguards, lack of independence of the judiciary, lack of uh, comply with crimes that are permissible under, under, un, un, under freedom of expression or under human rights law, and then uh, the surveillance powers that they will be used to prosecute such as crime will also be used to prosecute crimes that are can target dissidents, can target journalists, can target people who are being called terrorists just because they are just criticizing their government and speaking truth to power. Thank you. Um, it's very good to hear. We have a question from the chat from Thomas Claiborne from the Register. Do any of the provisions require the weakening of encryption to facilitate law enforcement access? Is one of his questions. I don't know whether Rama. <laughs> uh, the question um, was uh, Do any of the provisions require the weakening of encryption to facilitate law enforcement access? Raman, maybe you want to take that? I can bring that up. It's, in fact, we perhaps will know more about this in the next few days because the section on technical assistance will probably be discussed in this UN ad hoc committee next week. And that's, I think, where people have been concerned, that when you come to the proactive assistance that states will perhaps either do themselves or require the private sector to do, that that might be included there. Uh, I can you know, share in response to that question that previous discussions on this uh, issue have touched upon encryption. Some states have brought up concerns and said that the private sector should do more to facilitate direct access or other words like that. Now, again, those words can mean different things. Perhaps even the states mean them differently, but we've heard words like direct access. We heard words about proactive obligations of private sector entities. Uh, if the question is, is the exact language, say, replicating um, the weakening of encryption provisions that, for example, were carried in Australian law three years ago? No, not yet. But some of the states clearly are trying to bring that there. But also realistically, perhaps some governments know that saying that explicitly would result in a lot of opposition. So you'll probably see very quiet innuendo and comments next week that are worth watching. Mm. We have another um, very important question from Thomas Cleveland from the Register. Is there a scenario in which no agreement is reached and the whole treaty is abandoned? Or should we expect to see something even if based only on rules that get sufficient support. Katica? Yeah, I would like to reflect the encryption later because there is another provision that might be relevant. But uh, on answer to this question, um, we will say that um, there have been recently a leak between the United States and the European Union that are seeking to isolate Russia and China, which this means in practice is trying to bring some countries into the middle, meaning trying to move away from those countries and trying to get consensus among those countries. Whether that will succeed or not, I don't know, but that's the goal, and that seems that they want actually a treaty and they want to get consensus. It's not like in the past where um, where actually they were more diverse, or more not commitment to, to, to finalize the treaty. But actually, we only going, to, I cannot read like the future, right? Uh, we only going to see that when it comes to zero draft and see whether it's more narrow or, or is very wide. I think if the scope of the criminalization section is very wide, mm -hmm. I don't think there will be consensus on that. That's my, my personal opinion. 
And now on regarding the encryption, I think there is a provision that it's important, is the one about uh, digital evidence. Uh, it's not exactly about encryption, but it's a provision that provides an open-ended obligations on, on its days to give full way to digital evidence extracted from devices as long as the domestic forensic rules are respected. This means that the type of digital evidence extraction tools, uh, uh, you may know some of these companies who have been, uh, you can use, and endorsed by these provisions frequently include the ability to, to bypass device encryption and capture long deleted content. Yet there remain no clear safeguards in the treaty for ensuring that these powerful capabilities are not used to carry out flagrant human rights abuses. Far from putting such standards or such limitation, limitations in the text, the provision, the provision treated would legitimize the proliferation of these, of these extraction tools. Thank you. Yeah. That's extremely uh, interesting also because we, we had a similar discussion also in some European countries about whether you can even uh, get evidence from a hacked device because it has been tinkered with. Um, I also want to open up the other question from Thomas about where does this lead and maybe interpret it a little bit like not reading the future, um, but what are the scenarios which we can expect? Um, do the others maybe want to come in here? Should we expect a treaty at all or is there still a chance that this whole thing could fail? Maybe yeah, I can start, and I'm very interested in hearing the views of my colleagues. It's, there are a couple of options here. This is many of you mentioned, and particularly Ellie mentioned. It is on a lot depends on the zero draft because the decisions really will happen after the session, where the team that's working on this, the chair of the process, uh, as well as others, will have to produce a zero draft that they believe will get the majority of UN member states behind it. And it's very important to remember this. This process started by a simple majority in the General Assembly, but the outcome that they did finally then agreed upon was that to move it ahead as a UN treaty, it will require a two-third sign-off by the participating states in this, which means, in effect, while it may have started off as a simple majority, for it to be regarded as even partially successful requires a two-third majority, if not by full consensus. In fact, I think the text says we want full consensus, and if consensus doesn't occur, we need a two-third majority. Even that two-third majority, by the way, states can choose to support it as a UN treaty. It gets a UNTS number. It's designated as a UN treaty that the Secretary General can accept accession to, but states may choose not to sign it. There's a, there has been past complicated precedent in the space of, say, the oceans or even things like the Antarctic Treaty or parts of, say, you know, the, the Lunar Treaty as well. If something's become a UN treaty, sy treaty system document, but states have not really acceded to it. But I think it depends a lot on the zero draft, what happens in New York in the next session, which will be in August, and in the final outcome session, as Ellie mentioned, in January, which perhaps is an ambitious target, because it seems quite likely that there may not be full agreement. If, any, if uh, anyone looks at the red-lined version of the consolidated negotiating draft from the last session, it is full of red lines in every section. And those are red lines that this chair needs to make decisions on within barely a month, month and a half. And then states need to agree upon. Any additions to that, or maybe also to open it a little bit? I mean, we all been at the UN this week, so we also have our immediate observations of the past days. Is there anything you want to share how your assessment was of being in the room? Maybe if I can, if I can come here just to say, I mean, it is, it is fairly open still what the outcome of this treaty may be, if there will be a treaty at all. Um, and taking us from the last session and then also observing the, the first couple of days now, there are obviously, as we've mentioned already, the red lines, one of them being um, whether at all to include human rights language or whether to just have a very open, uh, very vague um, uh, paragraph that like roughly mentions um, obligations under international human rights law or to have it more specified. So there's been everything. We had the full range from take it all out until like have it very specifically and then lots of, lots of suggestions of, of, of actual wording. Um, we've observed similar um, trends this week with regard to data protection. So the data protection article that is in the, in, in the CND, in the, in, the, in the draft treaty now, is, um, well, fairly vague, fairly, fairly vague, I would say. 
And then the European Union obviously came with a very, very detailed um, suggestion for um, stronger data protection. Obviously, they cannot deviate from their, from their acquis or from the GDPR standards. Um, other countries supporting it um, today, and I don't recall what country it was, but we've heard that, well, this is not important. We don't need data protection in here at all, so we could remove it. Um, so again, this seems to be very um, diversive, and obviously um, some countries not going to be, are not going to be able to, to, to sign up to something that does not include or does not, is not in line with their, with their standards. Um, what else do I observe in the room? Just, um, yeah, well, <laughs> from a civil rights uh, organization's perspective, maybe, um, so far this process, or last session, the January session, was fairly inclusive in the sense that we all were and we all sat in one big room together with the delegations. Um, we could interact, you were you had the feeling you were part of this. We had the opportunity to intervene several times. Um, and to provide our own statements and observations. Um, well, three days have passed. Tomorrow is the last day of the first week, and we've not even had the opportunity to speak in, even once. So we're not in the same room. We are in a separate room, um, which gives you the feeling of being at the children's table of a family gathering or so, so you're not really part of the party. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope that changes because it really is a pity to, to, to have the feeling of being merely observing instead of act, act, actively participating. Just want to clarify that the phrasing of um, our room being the children's table, I heard that also from several state delegates. And um, on, on the point of data protection, uh, just to reiterate that, and that's also um, public in the stream, uh, my personal highlight was still the US saying data protection is yet another human right, so why even explicitly mention it? Um, yeah. So these are, these are real things that we hear in the plenary. I think we have a question in the room. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, it's, it's been really excellent to hear from you. Um, and I'm grateful for all, for all of your perspectives. Um, I, I want to stick with the, the emphasis on what's coming up next. And my question um, really also is just to ask you to reflect a little bit more, given how critical some of the issues that are being debated here are for journalists in particular, um, you know, why, why are, have there not been more, uh, why has there not been more coverage? Has there been good coverage of the treaty negotiations? And I think just turning to what's coming next, because we have been, I think as many of you mentioned, in sort of a state of suspension and limbo because the criminalization chapter and the, the human rights, the key human rights safeguard provisions are not under discussion here in this session. And so uh, it's a little bit matrixed and hypothetical, some of the, the cooperation and technical assistance chapters, but we'll have a zero draft. So from the perspective of journalists, you know, is, is this sort of the time to start engaging? And, and even for organizations that are representing journalists and, and their human rights and human rights defenders, is now a good moment for that? Just to um, also highlight that we uh, have this event today also here together with the International Press Institute. So there are thankfully some journalistic uh, press organizations that do care and, and try to put a spotlight on this. Um, Barbara, what is your question for you? I mean, this is just an observation. It's not like empirical study about how journalists cover this. I think there have been some coverage in form of op-eds. So I think all our organization publish op-eds and Whenever we approach, let's say, like Reuters and so on, they publish this op-ed. But I haven't seen them really kind of reporting on what's going on. And, but, you know, UN negotiations are, for a lack of a better word, like boring for journalists or like super technical. So if you sit in their room and they are going through the documents and many governments are making money, it's, it's not nothing like, it's not like a human story with journalists would bring. And, you know, it's probably also our responsibility to make it a human story. So to, to say how this is reflecting on what is going to happen to journalists if some of these proposals which have been put by some of the governments go through. But, yeah, so it's, it is disappointing. I don't think it's, like, super unusual for a treaty because this is, as I said, hardly kind of excites people to sit in the UN room and, you know, cover it. And also there's a lot of other things going on. So, like, in individual countries, let's say, like, on the EU level, there is a lot of, you know, how platforms are regulated and, you know, DSA, DMA, EMFA and all of that. So 
probably seems like too much, but that's also the reason why we are here and trying to engage journalists on the topic. So I hope that if you are a journalist, which I guess you are, uh, you know, will be up, up on you to, to make it into a human story which people will care about. I just wanted to add, supplement to that to just say I think the three also important factors. One, and this came up in the beginning of this process itself, the fact that a lot of the substantive sessions I've been here in Vienna removed from perhaps even the sort of limited New York or UN press bubble that exists in New York, sometimes Geneva on human rights issues is an important issue. And remember, uh, in the beginning of the process, for those unfamiliar, some states have expressed concerns. Smaller states, for example, don't keep full missions in Vienna. They may have one person who does 10 things or maybe limited participation. So that sort of New York versus Vienna split has been, I think, an issue, and it's been regarded as a more technical issue that people aren't engaged in, whereas actually it is a core, not just press freedom, it is a core civil liberties issue for all these matters. Secondly, there is this perception that this is a technical issue. In fact, as I say, the reason I access now, and I think many of us are there in the room, is actually because there is a lot of agreement between people in the room, because a lot of the folks in the room are law enforcement prosecutors and judges, and even the most human rights respecting of them sometimes do like a degree of executive discretion and authority. The sort of tension that requires I say, you know, a judge or a human rights judge to sometimes tell a prosecuting judge saying, I understand you want full power and, and authority, but maybe we need to put in safeguards. But there's already more agreement in the room, and that's perhaps sometimes why it's not as controversial, because people don't realize what's there. And lastly, sometimes this conversation that this is, as you said, like a Russia-China proposed process, I say it's an important one, but in fact, as everyone who's been part of the process recognizes, Russia may have triggered the resolution, but it's not a Russian process by itself. And in fact, that's a problem. I think our worry is that states, as Katitsa and a few others also mentioned, might trade away a lot in exchange for having a document or a treaty saying that, look, there's not failure here. You don't need to localize data in your country. You don't need to pass this drastic law. You can instead sign up to this international treaty. And that trade-off is what's alarming. And again, that's where I think sometimes the journalists don't always realize that because they get pulled into the origin of the treaty or is it a geopolitical conflict between Russia, China, and the rest of the world, and, and you know, on the other hand. And instead, actually, we need to go into the deal-making that's happening behind the scenes in the process. Mm -hmm. I can certainly draw a parallel to European politics, which is always already very hard to bring close to the national newspapers. This is even harder. Um, we have another question from the chat. Um, uh, uh, let's say this one first. Can the speakers talk about whether there are any states that are standing behind the inclusion of human rights safeguards? Like, who are the good guys? Can you repeat? Um, can the speakers talk about whether there are any states that are standing behind the inclusion of human rights safeguards? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned that in my speech. I think uh, I mentioned, um, uh, what is this? Uh, Russia, uh, Tonga, uh, I, I need, to, need to pull the numbers, the names, Pakistan, they, they were Iran, they were actually um, particularly uh, asking for the re removal of the general article on human rights, or even when it comes to conditions and safeguards, the limitations to surveillance powers and international cooperation, they also, some of them want to be remove, removal for the treaty. That was very concerning because it's not the discussion that we will have in Budapest that was weak standards, this is removal at all. <laughs> and so that was very surprising to me and very concerning. Um, yeah. I, I think and to further supplement, because I think the question also was, uh, which states are actively supporting? Uh, yes, sorry. yes, it's both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so those, the, the, the countries who were actively supporting, and supporting or against? Supporting. Supporting. Ah, supporting human rights. Um, there is the United States, obviously, it's also Europe. The strongest is also the European Union, who come up to say no strong safeguard, no surveillance measures unless there is robot human rights safeguards. And uh, they have been championed this in the treaty. I'm hoping to see more Latin American countries joining the European Union and form an alliance of hu pro human rights safeguards in the treaty uh, as strong as for instance, the European Union, who have put like a red line on, on this topic. Yeah. Right now we still see in the, in the, the version, uh, the current version um, of the first part of the CND, so the one, the, the version that we discussed in January, um, you see a whole list of alternatives to the general human rights um, paragraphs, a very short one, two lines that we mentioned, in different, you know, different levels of detail and different countries backing or numbers of countries backing one or the other. 
Um, and really, yeah, well, the European Union, we've seen a very good also um, um, proposal by Uruguay on behalf of a group of Latin American mm -hmm. countries. And, uh, yeah. The same is now happening also with data protection, obviously. So there is various, various um, suggestions. Yeah, so there, that's why it's also so interesting to cover. So even the sports journalists, this is a horse race, so please look at it. We have another question from the chat. Um, will the treaty address government use of hacking tools like NSO groups Pegasus directly or via contractors? So I don't know, Tanya, Raman, I think like there's, it, it, it could be read that way, would be my assessment. Uh, so, in fact, and that's a question I think even some people have had. Should a treaty like this categorically, you know, prohibit uh, or criminalize the use of spyware? And I think the concern, in fact, is ideally perhaps an international treaty or international legal action should do that. But in this treaty instead, we know that those hacking tools will be actually legitimized potentially. And some of the interventions made by Tanya as well as Katitsa referred a bit to that, that it, the ability to say in, take copies of data from a device or other things will be... Um, the powers will be provided in the treaty, and then uh, governments will come and say, well, it's provided for in the treaty. We're just using a third-party vendor to help us do this. Please let that be okay. And probably states are a bit smart. I don't think any state is going to publicly stand up and say, I'm going to defend NSO group, I'm going to defend this. But they'll instead say, yes, of course, we need sometimes to be able to access data, perhaps even for another government under lawful process. And then they will say, oh, the issue about how we do that via a vendor should be left to national uh, mechanisms. And please, some states will say, we don't want any human rights safeguards or independent mechanisms of that. That's one of the reasons why people are saying, while perhaps this treaty is not the best place to combat the use of human rights intrusive spyware, these safeguards on human rights, on accountability, or even how police forces or, uh, or prosecutorial authorities use these powers, that needs to be covered in the treaty because it's those checks and balances that will prevent these vendors from actually essentially conducting um, human rights infringing spyware attacks globally. And the other important part of this is, I find it funny, right? The work of legitimate security researchers may be criminalized, but the work of these folks who essentially are hackers for hire will be potentially permitted because it will be allowed to national governments to do this there. Is this a good place to combat you know, spyware? Perhaps not. Should there be more international action on spyware? Absolutely. Perhaps instead the UN should be doing that and not drafting this treaty, but that's where we are right now. I, 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 I have to I, uh, intervene here too. I mean, it's it's only I'm now I'm stepping out of my moderator okay. role. But um, to the question, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Just Please. a question, because he said if if the treaty authorized use of government hack in that part, uh, there are several provisions that could authorize and legitimize this treaty. We wanted an EFF and Privacy International to keep it outside the scope because, as we see, there is no human rights records at all, but the special investigative techniques is so open-ended that could actually authorize hacking. And then you have a certain interpretations of the language of real-time collections, you know, when it comes to use malware for location tracking, you know, that could be interpreted that it, to be in that provision. But without the safeguards that we were discussing, won't be possible to, you know, to, to we shouldn't authorize that because as we see, this, it will legitimize the use of these tools by authoritarian regimes, by the regimes that have been um, attacking or, um, or, uh, or invading the privacy of activist journalists, as we see recently in Mexico and many other parts of the world. Maybe, mm -hmm. if I may just add to that, if we talk about the very vague and open provisions and the a lot of you know room that there is for interpretation today we learned um, in the statement from well one country that there's not going to be any explanatory documents to that to this to this convention so um, I'd say this is yet another reason to be very worried yeah. yeah just to highlight there was also an open letter by civil society last year that in part also addressed that was I think signed by over 80 people we have another question here in the room Thanks, everyone, for this really informative discussion. Uh, Scott Griffin from the International Press Institute. So I think that the impact of this, of this treaty you know, on states with weak democratic standards and weak rule of law, I think we've, we've talked a lot about that um, it potentially may legitimize practices that already exist or obviously not provide any incentives to comply with human rights standards. I was wondering if you could say something a little bit more specific about the potential impact of the treaty on states, on democratic states that already have uh, existing standards, existing protections on these types of issues. Uh, what, type of, what type of practical impact would you see 
uh, let's say in Europe, uh, where you know data protection standards exist to a certain extent, uh, with this weaken already existing uh, standards. I'm just thinking practically about when the countries where we are working, uh, you know, here in Europe, for example, uh, what type of impact would we see? Who wants to take that? This is in European. I can have an example, but not European context. Mm -hmm. So international cooperation. Uh, this is, I think, the key issue. So the idea of the chapter international cooperation is about sharing information about the states. And because, as currently written, there is no limitation on the scope of international cooperation. It says uh, preventive. It's not to a specific crime, a specific investigation or prosecution of a serious crime. Investigation and prosecution is broader than that. It has preventing, disrupting, and many other words, uh, and not make it limited. What it could be is that, for instance, country A. Uh, with poor human rights records, you know, uh, will uh, have authority to use any surveillance technique, malware, mass surveillance tools. And that's not part of a treaty, but they have the power under domestic law to do what, what they want to do. And, but they could get that information and then sharing in the countries who are participating in joint investigations, so they are doing like an investigation uh, across countries that could involve different countries around the world. Well, these countries who may have higher standards and may not be able ever to access that type of data under, uh, it's not authorized to use that type of surveillance technique, could benefit from the information sharing uh, in these uh, joint investigations or in this uh, international cooperation among the states. I think it is clear or not? Uh, I'm trying to explain. That's one of, of the issues uh, on practical ramifications. The other one is legitimizing these, these, these techniques. You know, legitimize these techniques uh, with countries with poor human rights records, which we have been challenged in courts. We have a lot of courts when there is location tracking without safeguards, if there is no, you know, uh, uh, a lot of uh, access to content without the proper uh, proper safeguards or just location tracking, which is very sensitive, and you have a higher level of protection. Well, the, the treaty is not given that, and it gives them the words of those countries to not modify their law or to not adapt their law or to even just say, well, we comply with the treaty, you know, it's a big, big uh, safeguards, and we're fine. So that's our main concern. Yeah, and for democratic countries, I the counter for democratic countries, and for the common countries is the one that I say. Yeah, that's my thought. And I was going to just add, Scott, it also depends a lot on what gets in the final version of the treaty, because some of the proposals of criminalization are so broad, they would bring, in fact, new provisions on extremism, or provisions on cyber terrorism, which no one fully knows what they mean, what it means, or even provisions such as, for example, potentially the uh, criminal mandates around fake news. That is one proposal that's linked, for example, to the uh, from a proposal from the People's Republic of China. So a lot of those are quite problematic. Now, again, it's perhaps the case that those provisions will not easily get through there. But there's a lot of pressure. And I think also there'll be, the other thing that will also explode is that the number of data requests to lots of these democratic countries will significantly increase. And they'll have to have clearer abilities to answer what they're giving access to or not. So that pressure is going to be there. So there's going to be pressure on criminalization. There's also going to be pressure just a general massive increase in the number of requests coming from potential signatories to this treaty. I, I do have an answer for data protection. It just came right to me, if you allow me. So uh, uh, as we see, there is a global discussion on data protection. There is different trends, you know. We have the European Union, the GDPR, who have been the basis for global, uh, the model for privacy laws, data protection laws around the world. Many countries in Latin America have used it. Then we have um, some of the police directive uh, in, in the EU who have been translated, but not as much as Globally, we want that, but we have seen a, a slow adoption by many countries. By putting, uh, so one of our concerns in the treaty, whether, you know, if, if data protection will be included, and if it's excluded, whether it will undermine actually the global trend that, or, and the impact that data protection has already outside, uh, out, uh, outside the, the negotiation of this treaty. Whether this trend of adoption that has come naturally um, through the years. Uh, if they encode standards that are very weak, much weaker. Um, now, that will be for data protection, but police directives have not been implemented as I want, you know, as we would like to see. But still, you know, the standards that the European has on the police directives could be higher than 
what we could achieve on, in here. And one of my concerns is that the Budapest Convention, the second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention, already engulfed some data protection principles in this treaty and authorized the use of biometric with very weak standards. Having this in the treaty, a detailed safeguards on, on, on criminal investigations, could open the door to authorize this type of weak standards uh, and globally. Now, being said that, some countries don't have nothing and whether these weak standards will serve, that, serve them, it's a question to see. I question that will serve them because I think that the problems that they have is that they already have weak institutional democratic, uh, in weak institutional um, institutions. Uh, and so I think that they will do what they want to do. <laughs> That's my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Um. We have another question from the chat, which is an interesting one. Has the passage of laws like the UK's online safety bill or Canada's C11 bill affected the negotiations at all? I don't know who can answer that, what it is. I don't know Canada's C11 bill. I know the UK online safety bill. It hasn't been yet adopted. Mm -hmm. UK online yeah. safety bill hasn't been adopted. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it says here the passage of such laws. I mean, they, they, okay. they, are, they are not so, passed So yet. fortunately, that uh, train wreck of the law hasn't been adopted. I haven't seen the impact on it, but I can't really. I mean, maybe colleagues who have... I think it, it, like, you're not saying directly, uh -huh. but you are seeing this uh, willingness from states, to, or some states in the Western states to say, well, you know, we're not going to be always aggressive saying that don't talk about online harms or new provisions because our governments are doing them. And the perception... Let me just put it this way. It definitely emboldens their counterparts mm -hmm. in many other countries, not just authoritarian states, but even challenged democracies or contested democracies who will come up and say, but the UK is passing exactly what we want, and we just want a little bit more. Why can't we do that? It's a good say Some people will say, for example, the UK wants to do this for child sexual abuse imagery or other material. We want it for that, plus this other vulnerable community, and perhaps this issue because for us, political instability causes you know, violent situation, so why can't we cover this as well? So that's there, I think that tenders there, it's not come in the room, we have not heard anyone explicitly mm -hmm. mention, you know, these laws, perhaps also because that's a UN uh, arcane procedure thing, if you name a state, it triggers a right to reply, so most states are very careful from not normally criticizing each other's domestic laws, although there has been a lot of discussion around state cyber behavior, particularly around Russia, but that embolden, emboldenment of positions is definitely partly occurring, but not as express, explicitly as perhaps we would have expected or feared. Mm. Not yet. Thank you, Roman. Um, Ellie, I would like to come back to you and also talk about the, really what's next in the process. Um, you, you were hinting in your introductory statement that there's a lot more to come. And maybe even looking beyond, if we, if we have a treaty, how will implementation look like? Like, um, maybe also explain this for people who might have never observed such a process before. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do so. So, um, in terms of just the next stages, we have, of course, the outcome of the negotiations that we're currently having. Um, as I mentioned before, we have the zero draft to be discussed at the August session. And then we have the uh, kind of final session in early 2024. Um, I think, as we've heard, quite a lot of the countries are keeping the powder dry. So I think, you know, if there's a chance in which the treaty isn't, uh, doesn't become a treaty, then we might start to figure that out by the August session. Um, and then in respect to the session in early 2024, um, I think Roman mentioned this in his comments, but the decision of states whether to exceed the treaty is indeed a political one. Uh, so while there may be an impetus within the room to agree the treaty, uh, there's still some scope for us here and um, you and people outside of this room to influence that process. And maybe that's like a more hopeful note that we could touch upon what we can do in this time to build that pressure. And then indeed there is what happens if the treaty is adopted uh, from early 2024. Uh, the question will then turn to implementation, but there's a lot of work that we need to do now in respect to implementation. So the treaty itself will set out what that process is. What we would like to see is that treaty having at least the same means and modalities for 
uh, civil society to engage in the process as we have at present. So we want to see at least the same access to the room in any future negotiations regarding the contents of the treaty. Uh, that's one thing. Um, and more broadly, we want to see t uh, countries taking a more open approach. So as Tanya said, so we had the opportunity to speak more at the last session. We will indeed get that at some point, uh, but are we really being heard? And I think that's a pretty critical point to think about. Absolutely, and that's also why um, that um, basically the premise under which I want to close, if there are no urgent questions from the room or virtually, um, Neither of you had the opportunity to speak and to send a message to negotiators um, in the UN, but I can give you this opportunity here. Um, so I don't want you to read the formal oral statements that you all prepared, but what would be the message to negotiators that you would like to send? Like, What would be um, the key message, the key wish that you would formulate for them to reach a good outcome from a human rights perspective? Uh, one, uh, reduce the scope of the treaty through all the chapters, criminalization, criminal provision, international chapters, make it narrow to cover cyber crimes, make sure that any crime and any profile measure is compliant with international human rights law. We need also to make sure that any powers that will be authorized are actually compatible with international human rights law, and that any powers that are embedded in the treaty don't bypass their own safeguards that are in the treaty, which is happening in some provisions. So some provisions are subject to the safeguards and some others not. And so make sure that it's a cross-cutting. And my ideal world, I would like to see a coalition of countries from developing countries and and the European Union and maybe the United States to push for a strong, not only data protection safeguards, but privacy safeguards uh, uh, against uh, law enforcement access to data and see that as a champion, a champion of human rights. And finally, I would like to see a mechanism of implementation on the treaty uh, oversight body that will monitor the compliance of the treaty obligations with human rights within the, uh, the, the the treaty discussion, so we could have an uh, existing human rights body mechanism could, could assess that compliance because there is a mechanism of implementation, another section of the treaty, which will create such a body. Yeah. And that is Mundeskoskola, etc. So me also reduce the scope of offenses and almost like no content-based offenses because the Budapest Convention, as I said, has only two, which is like sec sexual abuse images, child sexual abuse images, and you know, that you can probably, inclusion is justified. There's also criminal copyright, criminalization of copyright infringements, which I would like not to see in this, although they are in the Budapest Convention, but basically like very, very limited, maybe like one content-based offense and greatly reduce the scope of other offenses. My, my message would be simple. Uh, a cybercrime treaty should not be a lowest common denominator, race to the bottom situation. It is a chance to shape a paradigm that lifts standards up. And this is something that the UN was founded on, actually. It can drag standards up for countries. It's not just about negotiating to a common minimum and some of the procedural safeguards that Katitsa and Barbara mentioned be part of that. But the other most important message I would say is very simple. Don't criminalize directly or by omission the work of the human beings that make cybersecurity possible. Don't make us more cyber insecure. A cybercrime treaty is not just for the cybercrime units or police services, it's for all of the people involved in making our systems, our networks cyber secure. Well, very simple as well. Uh, make this a race to the top and not to the bottom. Um, don't introduce any surveillance techniques through the back door um, that might not even be explicitly uh, mentioned in the treaty. And ultimately, we really have to, have to ask ourselves, do we want to have countries like Russia, China, or Egypt to define what safeguards should be in the treaty and what safeguards should be there for um, online surveillance or the exchange of electronic evidence? Yeah, so in addition to all of the above, um, I guess just bearing in mind what we shared about the risks to human rights, um, I would just ask the question, to states of, um, you know, does this treaty respond to the actual needs that some countries have in respect to combating cybercrime? You know, give that some thought. And indeed, if that is the intent, what would a rights-enabling treaty look like? <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you very much. I think then we can come to a close. I also want to thank the audience here and virtually for participating and particular applause to the panelists and let's hope we'll have a good second week of negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.